So it's a pleasure to talk to you about this project. I should note, periodically I Google Matchmaker Exchange to get our website up, and I found a new website today that I was very intrigued by. There's now a, a web, I bought various URL domains for our website. I neglected to buy the matchmakerexchange.com, which is now launched. Matchmaker Exchange revolutionized the search for love <laughs> by bringing together professional matchmakers from around the world onto one global platform. So they've, they've captured what we're trying to do in another domain. It's, uh, I think they're em emulating us, but anyway, um, nonetheless, we are focused on a slightly different aspect of matchmaking. Um, we are trying to bring matchmakers around the world together to really solve gene, rare, gene, uh, rare diseases. And I am speaking on behalf of a large group of individuals that have come together to really put this project together. And just to very simply state what we're trying to work on, the goal is to identify causal genes for rare disease by matching phenotypes and genotypes across a federated network of genomic databases. And this is an illustration one of the members of our group put together to just show here um, you know, one geneticist here with a case with a series of phenotypic features um, that might overlap with another case with a series of phenotypic features. And in those cases, they've sequenced and found candidate genes, one or more, maybe a de novo variant in a novel gene without enough evidence to implicate that gene in disease. But as you and astutely pointed out, sometimes just having a second case is all you need to gather enough evidence to implicate this gene in, in, as causative. So that is what the, the purpose of this project is trying to do, is to bring these rare cases from around the world together. Um, so when we all met in ASHG a couple years ago, we were at this state, lots of databases, each in and of themselves matchmakers trying to bring their sets of cases together. but each with small data sets, trying to figure out how can we bring this group together in a way to be more productive in solving rare disease. It turns out it's, it's more challenging than it may seem to just link up a bunch of databases, and I think that Ben Hutton had the best image of this project at that stage in time. It was a little more complex to try to get these databases linked in a productive way. And, and why is that? Well, partly because if you look at each of these databases, the data schemas and the content of those databases was not all the same. Some databases you know, collected variant call files without identifying candidate genes. Others just really focused on what the gene was. Others using model organisms. Others using HPO phenotype terms. And so how do you really connect all these databases and find commonalities when the data schemas are, together, are, are different? So it did take a fair bit of work working through this project to come up with ways to be productive in how we match. And the, the first part of that was defining the matchmaker API. It was initially developed by two of the matchmakers, but then worked um, together with the Global Alliance Data Working Group to really bring that into the same standards being used by this organization globally. Um, we also worked with the Regulatory and Ethics Work Group to create a consent policy. And I have, we'll probably distribute these slides, I have an appendix with all the details in it, but I won't go through them right now. Um, we also came up with a document with the requirements to be a matchmaker service, what you have to accomplish to be part of that uh, LinkedIn network to make it function and what the user agreement is to be able to, to put data in, use it, um, and, and functionally access that data. It's a work in progress working on the security requirements of each of these databases. So I just wanted to walk through sort of a specific example of how this is working. Um, and some of these slides were taken from Mike Brudno and Kim Boycott. So this is an example of the Phenome Central database. This is one of the matchmakers. So here in Phenome Central, this is a database in Canada that Mike's team has built. Um, and there's a lot of phenotypic data that are collected through the phenotypes application um, to enter all of that data into the system. The actual API and how it functions is really a query by example. So the idea is you, you enter a real patient with a real phenotype and or their gene or genotype data into the system, and the response from the matchmaker service, both within the matchmaker and then globally with our matchmaker exchange, is to come up with a list of similar patient profiles. And I should note that the matching algorithms are continually under development right now, so there, there are algorithms that have been launched, but you can imagine how concretely you match and what you allow to be considered similar is an evolving process. So in this case, um, 
using Phenome Central, you can enter your case and you will come up with a list of similar cases that you can uh, peruse through, get scores on how close those matches are um, based on the gene, the variant, the phenotypic features. So that's happening internally within this database. That's an example of the matchmakers operating within themselves. And in this case, it actually generates an email for you to send to this, the source of the other cases in there so you can contact that particular um, individuals uh, to get the case data. Um, so what we've now been working on is not just doing matching within those systems, but to actually connect through an API the two different more multiple databases. So the pilot project really connected Phenome Central in Canada with Gene Matcher, led by Ad Hamash at Johns Hopkins University in the U.S. Uh, and this is um, a little bit of detail about the Gene Matcher system that Ada's group maintains. And initially, this was really designed to connect clinicians and researchers with the same gene candidate. Literally, all you'd do is go in, enter your gene, and see if there was any other cases um, with the same gene. And over time, they have increased their data in the system, and this is a, a look at the number of matches happening internally within Gene Matcher over the course of the last year or two. So the system is, is really functioning as it should. However, this has been mostly fa focusing on gene to gene. And then you look at the phenotype and see if there's any similarity, which there may not always be. So now if you connect the two, gene matcher to Phenome Central, um, this is an example of a return from the Phenome Central system where it's now querying out to gene matcher to decipher the two databases that have been linked. And what you're getting oops, um, is, go back for a second can't go, oh, there we go. Um, you're getting uh, the actual match. Now, in this case, the gene matched, but if you look at your queried patient with the matched patient, there's really no overlap. So this would be a case where you'd exclude this as a likely match, even though the gene candidate might have matched. So you can see how very quickly you want to refine your matching algorithms to not waste your time on unreliable matches. And that's a, an ongoing work in progress within this group is to think about those matching algorithms and how we can refine them. So in the, in the pilot phase, first there's a test data set that um, match, the matchmakers have put up, Orion Busk and others have created this, and they implemented those test cases into both databases and were successfully able to match all those test cases that were present in both. But then they took 45 unsolved cases with flagged candidates in Freedom Central, matched that against the gene matcher database at Hopkins. Ten matches were found. Six of them were false positives. Again, this is this gene-only sort of matching where you look at the phenotypes are clearly not the same. Two uh, matches that are still a work in progress and two that are thought to be potentially significant. So even just with small data sets and two matchmakers, we're starting to see progress in this game. Um, now, the, uh, Decipher has also launched the API, so now we have really three of the groups that have successfully launched the API and connected to their databases in this project, and there are a, a, a number of other of the matchmakers that are actively working to launch it as well. We are excited about a special issue of Human Mutation that Ada Kim Boycott and myself, our guest editors for, really summarizing a lot of the work that's been happening over the last year and a half. And in this case, we 16 papers have been submitted, one that we wrote on an overview of the whole project, one on the API, two papers on the mathematics of matching algorithms, papers from many of the matchmakers, uh, individual systems, and we have three papers that actually document cases that have been solved through matchmaking. So we're really excited that that issue will be coming out in October, timed for both uh, a session, a day-long meeting at, on the matchmaker and a session at ASHG um, at that meeting. Um, so th the obvious next question, and many people ask me this, well, how can I participate in matchmaker exchange? And how, what if I have a case, what do I do? So just wanted to make it very clear. So there's two ways to participate in this project. Well. You can also join our listserv and simply join our conference calls every month if you want to learn about what we're doing. But if you actually have a case, you have two choices. One, you can either connect your own database, like many of the matchmakers have been doing, implementing the API so that you can join and match your, many of your cases. Or you can actually choose to work with an existing matchmaker service. If you're just out there with one case, you're a clinician, let's say, you have a candidate gene in your case and you 
want to find matches, you can just go and choose a matchmaker service to enter your case into. So what we're working to do, and this is a, a table from the, the paper we wrote that will go onto the website soon, which is to help guide wh which matchmaker you might want to work with. Because each of those has different purposes, different data structures, um, different ways of matching. Um, and so we've tried to illustrate of each of the different systems, what types of information they collect on phenotypes, non-human models, genotype, whether they track candidate genes, what are the parameters used for matching that might help people sort of decide where to put their case. If you just have a gene, you want to stick it in, maybe gene matches the place. If you have a whole VCF file, maybe go to GEMAP, et cetera. So those are the things that we're trying to help guide the community in terms of using the system. And that we do have a website, as I alluded to at the beginning, matchmakerexchange.org. There's still not very much on it. Um, now that we've worked in getting all these papers out, now in advance of ASHG, we're going to try to put some of this more guidance um, information to help people figure out how to use the system. Um, and that's a work in progress. So um, just a little bit about sort of future directions. So to date, this has been a fairly focused project in terms of finding matches when you have a candidate gene in hand. However, as many of you know, you may sequence a case and have no idea what's causing disease and not have found anything in your case. And so we really are now sort of, and, and tomorrow in our three-hour meeting, we'll spend a little bit of time thinking about the future of the matchmaker exchange, how we think about hypothesis-free matching, aggregating data sets to look for commonalities that might not be obvious in an individual case. So that's one of our uh, goals to think about. And, and another goal is, you know, although this is a great example, I think, of, of sharing data and bringing data sets around the world, at, at some point these data sets still are not very open to the broad community. Um, and so I think it's worth it to think about how can we designate cases that people are willing to share more broadly. Um, and Decipher has already apportioned, you know, 15,000 cases or so in their database to be just freely searched on whether you have a case or not. And that can support much broader uses of this data, defining phenotypic spectra, metadata analyses, algorithm training, all sorts of things that you might do. So I think, you know, this will be a work in progress to think about how we can designate more of the data in these different systems to be uh, queried in broader ways. We're also working with two of the groups, both uh, ClinGen as well as um, the Genetic Alliance, in incorporating patient-initiated matchmaking. Some of you may have heard the story of, of Matthew Might, who actually solved his own child's case through blogging and other internet-based approaches um, and really did an amazing job. And we want to engage the, the patient community in this process, although there's complexities there in how to support that. So these are things that we're working on at this point. Um, I will stop there and acknowledge the many people that have been involved in this project. It's been really a, a wonderful group effort. I do have uh, an appendix of details on all the stuff that we've put together in terms of documentation that I'm happy to distribute. But I think I'll stop there and, and happy to take any questions. Fabulous. Actually working. Huh? <laughs> almost working. problem solved. <laughs> Should never say that. No. Questions or comments, please. Thank you, Heidi. Always, in, always inspiring. Um, I think it would be worthwhile mentioning to the audience, like the same as the Beacon three tiers with the new tier called registered access, mm -hmm. the two tiered consent in the matchmaker, which now um, claims that at the querying function where anybody out there seen this before or have a patient like this or recognize these symptoms, the consent, the two-tiered maintains that that, thank you very much, is not um, uh, a, a, a consentable level of query. Now, this is quite controversial. It's going to be a long and winding road, and luckily Heidi's uh, <laughs> and others are, are, are leading it. But this is a new approach, like the registered access, and we really I'm going to have to sort of, I think the regulatory ethics working group is going to try to refine this a little bit more. We need to get buy-in. We need to simply say this is the way we're doing things now. We can't bring genomes and phenomes together if we don't allow physicians to, to as they always have done, yeah. connect. What I'm, my question is, um, the patient initiated, uh, how, to, how in your sort of future meanderings or musings um, do you see this? In a, in a secure way, how, how's that? Yeah, there, so there's, there's a couple things, just to be clear what Barth is uh, talking about. We did differentiate two levels of consent. 
one that does not require consent, where a physician who's got a patient p result in front of them of unclear significance could enter in the gene name and structured phenotypic terms into the system and with that level of detail, not considering that identifiable, considering that really the practice of medicine, that is what physicians do today when they call up their colleague and say, have you ever seen a patient with X, Y, and Z? That is how we practice medicine today. That should not require a research consent or clinical consent. That is level one, and we have in the paper documented very clearly that we do not believe consent is required for that type of active searching. However, as you go and share actual variants and details, you get into the level two where we do feel consent is, is required. But to get back to your question, Bartha, in terms of patient, we, you know, this is a tricky uh, approach, and the way we're approaching it through Genome Connect, which is ClinGen's patient registry, is that we will actually serve as stewards of those matches so that the patients can initiate, well, I should say this is really early stage, so we're, the patient crossroads organization that maintains that platform is working to actively implement the API so that technically this can work um, using patient data that's in Genome Connect. However, the results of those matches will first go to us as investigators so that we can weed out the false positives and decide how to handle that sort of matching, because they, they will need you know, a steward to help with that process depending on their level of understanding. So there is a lot of detail to work out and, and Sharon Terry has been working with Mike Brudno through the peer system and thinking about how to launch that. So we are still very much in the early stages of thinking about how patients can be advocates for their own cases and helping them with that, but it will require some thought. Hi, uh, Yves Moreau, University of Leuven. Should that level two uh, uh, not be part of consent uh, standard for patients in the future? Because, I mean, the best thing would be that patients consent to having their data shared in register access databases. I think that's the most meaningful, meaningful thing to do. Yes, yeah, so actually that's a great question. So we have been working on um, a single less than one page clinical consent. There's been a lot of effort in this uh, space, particularly by Bartha's group and the Global Alliance, on a common research template for consent with particular standardized elements. We are working on the corollary to that, which is a clinical consent. So if, if you're not in a research study, but you just want to say, you can share my data, we need to facilitate that with patients. So we have uh, worked on and drafted, we've been working with NIH on this. We actually met with Bartha at our ClinGen meeting two weeks ago and are getting Bartha's input through the regulatory and ethics work group as well to really refine this clinical consent, which just says, I'm a patient, I'm willing to share my data, sign away. And that is, I think, critical because we are not going to capture most of these patients through research studies. We are got to capture them, and I think Ewan spoke to this terrifically in thinking about the interface with the clinical electronic health records and, and clinical patient world and directly access that data. So it's a, well, a point well taken. Heidi, thank you very much. <clears throat> Astonishing. So